Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This series was made possible in part through the generosity of Amgen, and we thank them for their support. My name is Heather Jordan, and I am the Associate Director of Public Education at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to, the, to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are healthcare professionals, we're glad that you've joined us today and we hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credit and you will not receive a certificate upon completion. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, Please allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Keith Melanson. Dr. Melanson is originally from Louisiana and did his medical training at Tulane University in New Orleans. After completing his surgical training, Dr. Melanson did a multi-organ transplant fellowship at the University of Minnesota. After his fellowship training, Dr. Melanson became the director of kidney and pancreas transplant first at Johns Hopkins University, followed by Georgetown University, then Washington, the Washington Hospital Center, and the Children's National Medical Center from the years 2004 to 2012. Since 2013, Dr. Melanson has been the director of the George Washington Transplant Institute, where he is a professor of surgery and the medical director of the Ron and Joy Paul Kidney Center. Dr. Melanson is an internationally renowned expert in paired kidney exchanges ABO incompatible kidney transplantation, pancreas transplantation, and immunologic desensitization for organ transplants. Dr. Melanson has on four occasions set the world's record for largest paired kidney exchange. Dr. Melanson's passion and research has centered on trying to increase access to organ transplantation for minority patients and sensitized patients who have few options for kidney transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Melanson, for joining us. Well, thank you, and it's my distinct pleasure to be here uh, this morning because um, I do believe education about kidney disease is so very important uh, to sustaining the uh, lifestyle and the lifespans of our patients. Um, we're going to jump right here into the first slide, and this is a, a slide I always like to show because I think that for patients that have kidney disease, or really patients overall with any sort of um, issue, it's very important for people to be proactive about their health care. Um, I always like to show the contrast between Apollo and Dionysus because, after all, the, you know, a Dionysian lifestyle is one of um, little responsibility. And a lot of what we see in medicine, particularly with kidney disease and diabetes and high blood pressure, are people that are not taking control of their health care decisions. We want people to be more like the Greek god Apollo. Um, with Apollo, you had someone that took control and was very visionary in doing the right things insofar as um, their lives and um, health care. So that's what we want for, from our patients. So what causes kidney disease? Really, it's not that difficult. Two, there are two main issues in this country, and now we're seeing more of a problem with obesity, but diabetes and high blood pressure, hypertension, are the two main reasons why we see so much kidney disease in this country. We really have an epidemic in uh, kidney disease. It's increasing at a, 
at a, um, a phenomenal rate, and it's primarily is because of the fact that here in America, we have such a problem with obesity, such a problem with diabetes, continue to have a big problem with hypertension. We see a lot more kidney disease in the minority populations, particularly African Americans and um, the um, Hispanic American population as well. Okay, so ob obesity is a huge problem, and um, all of the same reasons why um, people need to be losing weight, uh, kidney disease is also one of the main issues. Obesity has caused more of an increase in kidney disease than any other recent problem because of the fact that diabetes and um, hypertension are, are married to um, increasing weight. Again, hypertension and diabetes. Most people that have kidney disease today have either diabetes or a combination of diabetes and um, in stage, or no, of diabetes and hypertension. Okay, this is a map of Washington, D.C. that I, um, I always like to show um, people in the um, mid-Atlantic region, but really it, it translates to what we see around the world. The red area um, in Washington, D.C., um, as you go east, you also have more minority patients and socioeconomically, um, you dip a bit. As the, the socioeconomics decrease, as the minority populations increase, in-stage renal, renal disease increases. This is the same with every major metropolitan area in this country. It just so happens that Washington, D.C. has the highest incidence of kidney disease currently in the country, and it is because of this concentration of um, a minority population and the decreased access to to good uh, healthcare resources. Again, who gets in stage renal disease? It it cuts across all socioeconomic and um, ethnic populations, but it is particularly a problem in the minority population, particularly African Americans. African Americans tend to have a risk that is four to five times that of um, their white counterparts. Here in um, our area, we have partnered with various grassroots organizations, but I just wanted to uh, focus on National MOTEP because I think this organization shows what can happen when you tie together education and opportunities um, with changing the behavior of people. When I was in my training, minority patients, particularly African Americans, rarely donated their organs after death for transplantation. It was in the order of 1% to 2% of, of deaths that would have been available to um, be kidney donors or organ donors uh, when I was training, and I trained back in the 1990s. This has totally changed, and now African Americans are actually the most alt altruistic of all um, organ donors, and that has to do with not just MOTEP, but organizations like that. You know, I would say the American Kidney Fund, the National Kidney Foundation, all of these grassroots sort of organizations that have actually taken it upon themselves to go into the community, uh, be it churches, fairs, whatever, this has changed the behavior of people. Education of patients is of the utmost importance. Um, with the risk of sounding um, somewhat political, um, we have at um, George Washington um, Hospital and University where I am, we have the Rodham Institute, which of course um, Hillary Rodham Clinton's um, mother was a patient at GW Hospital. And I think this is an example of, again, community outreach. The Rodham Institute, and there are many institutes like this across the country, but the money that was invested in this institute has to do with increasing access for patients that um, do not have the socioeconomic means to get the best healthcare access. Healthcare access and education are very important if you're going to change the behavior of people. Uh, another example of this in the DC area is this clinic, which is the Whitman Walk Walkman Health Clinic. This is a clinic that was primarily, primarily focused on increasing access for HIV medications. Currently in the Washington, D.C. area, that same slide that I showed you where you have the most um, 
kidney disease percentage-wise in the country, you also have the highest risk of HIV transmission. Clinics like the Whitman Walker Clinic actually have um, done a yeoman's job of going into those areas and increasing access to the HIV medication by marrying together healthcare education and access what they've been able to do is take a very vulnerable population and get them access to medications and make their HIV transmission rates much, much lower. I think it's a great model of what can happen when the community is um, not only um, given knowledge, but also empowered with changing their health care and their health care choices. Getting back to kidney disease, this is what I was referring to earlier. Um, chronic kidney disease is increasing. This is not just in stage renal disease, stage five, but even stage two and stage three. All, of, all types of kidney disease are increasing in our country. And in stage renal disease in particular has um, seen a, um, a great increase in the last um, a few decades and it's, in, and it's continuing to increase. This is um, a usually when people find themselves requiring some sort of renal replacement therapy, either um, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or transplantation. And the costs are just absolutely staggering. I mean, the cost of kidney disease alone will, will uh, eventually bankrupt Medicare if it continues apace uh, at um, its current rate. We must decrease the amount of money we are paying to take care of people with kidney disease. And again, what we have to remember is um, there are five stages of kidney disease, and the first three stages can be well managed if there is interdiction with um, health care resources. We should be focusing on the things that lead to kidney disease, things like obesity and hypertension and diabetes. If we do a much better job of dealing with these precursors, we would have a lot less patients requiring um, transplant or hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. However, if you compare the cost of transplant to the cost of um, dialysis, what you find is that although you have to pay a lot of money for transplant up front, it's actually cheaper on, on the long run and even on a yearly basis for someone to get a transplant rather than um, to be on um, dialysis. Most places in the country, it's going to cost upwards of $80,000 a year to be on dialysis. And it costs usually around $30,000 a year to have um, a patient get a transplant. So both forms of therapy are expensive, much more expensive than having people simply take high blood pressure medicine or insulin therapy. Um, however, um, transplant is a lot more cost effective than dialysis. This slide is a little uh, complex and I'll try to explain it. Um, really all you see there is that um, people tend to die while they await transplantation. In other words, if you need a transplant, what you would want is to be transplanted as soon as possible. How do you get transplanted quickly? Well, you would typically need a live donor. So living uh, donation is really the key to quick transplant. Getting, getting transplanted quickly is going to be the way that you are um, saved, the, the way that your life is saved. The life expectancy for someone that's sitting on dialysis, even someone that's awaiting a transplant, is much accelerated compared to a normal life expectancy. People that get transplanted tend to have normal life expectancies, maybe a little shortened than um, if you didn't have kidney disease, but much, much longer than people that are on dialysis. What you see in this slide is that um, other than um, the patients that are in blue, all of the other um, uh, patients are, uh, that are alive have gotten transplanted, whereas the other patients are dying. If you look at, um, and this is another slide that's looking at the survival difference, in red are the transplant patients. In other words, five years after transplant, most, uh, more than 80% of those patients are still alive. The green are, are showing, um, over the same period, people that are on dialysis. Five years on dialysis, only about 35% of those patients 
are still alive. So over 80% compared to um, 30%. That's a huge difference in survival. If you look at the number of transplants that are occurring in the country, the numbers are going up, but again, it's not keeping up with the pace of the establishment of kidney disease. We only do about um, 18,000 kidney transplants per year, and there are well over 100,000 people that are on kidney transplant list. So over 100,000 people on the list, 18,000 per year, that's a huge gap. And like the earlier slide with the patients that are dying on the list, most of those patients that are not transplanted, the almost 90,000 of people that miss out every year, most of those patients will die at an accelerated rate while they await transplant. If you look at um, the risk of kidney disease by um, race or rather ethnicity, what you find is that African Americans um, as, as well as Native Americans, have a much higher risk of kidney disease compared to uh, Caucasians. But pretty much any ethnic group in this country has an increased risk of kidney disease when compared to uh, white patients, and it is worse for uh, African Americans. If you look at um, what happens after transplant, there is a difference, you know, white patients do do slightly better than African Americans, but overall, all groups of patients do much better once they get transplanted compared to how they do on dialysis. And here, this slide actually goes out 10 years, and what you find is, on average, um, about half of the patients that got transplanted are still alive, um, I'm sorry, their grafts are still functioning. 10 years after transplant. The survival of the actual patients is even much better, more in the order of almost 80%. That is much, much better, dramatically better than patients that would have gotten, um, or would remain on dialysis. So people always want to ask me, um, why is there so much kidney disease in African American patients? There are lots of reasons. Um, the increased rate of hypertension and diabetes, of course, um, contributes, but we also believe that there is some genetic reason. This slide, again, very complex slide, but it basically shows one gene in particular that we have followed, and we find that it is of increased um, uh, intensity or uh, increased um, prevalence in African-American patients. It's called APOL1. And this is one reason, one genetic reason, why these patients may have um, more kidney disease. If you look at the um, uh, Africa, um, it, further I'm going to try to explain why you see so much kidney disease in African Americans. Um, if you think about the slave trade, people from all different parts of Africa were brought together. And what you have to remember about Africa is that it is the most genetically diverse place on the planet. So these people that are, um, you know, we, we now call them black, but really genetically they're very disparate. They were all mixed together um, in, during the slave trade and brought into this new world. And these genetic differences are these genetic uh, mutations that um, these people in all these different areas of Africa developed to deal with diseases like malaria were concentrated in a small group of people that came over um, and expanded to become African Americans. We believe that these, um, it's not genetic differences, but, but rather what we um, tend to call protein differences. So the genes are not that different, but the proteins that are encoded for, um, by the genes, we call that epigenetics, are different and it could lead to more kidney disease. What are the current issues? Um, for kidney transplantation, because we have a, um, a group that is at such risk of end-stage renal disease, well, it's going to be access. So um, what you want is to expand access to the groups of patients that have the biggest problems getting transplant. Those are going to be um, uh, primarily African-American patients, patients that tend to stay on, stay on dialysis longer. Once people get transplanted, graft survival is a big deal. Well, guess what? The quicker you get transplanted, the more likely your grafts are to survive. So again, we want to increase access and give patients um, or get patients transplanted as soon as possible. 
sensitization is a problem. And what sensitization basically says is um, people that are on dialysis longer, people that have had blood transfusions, even pregnancies for women, all these things can, call what, can cause what's called sensitization, where antibodies build up in the blood. That can make it more difficult for people to get transplanted, and it also can make the transplant process more difficult. And we just need to get more organ donors. That includes deceased donor as well as live donor. People need to um, discuss this with their friends and family because these are the people that are most likely to donate to you if you need a kidney disease. And people that, are, um, that die um, need to sign up, usually on your license, to be kidney donors. Um, that is going to help us get more people transplanted. So what do we have to do? We have to um, increase education. Education is key. You have to educate people about access to transplantation, access to live kidney uh, transplant, access to different types of um, dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, home hemodialysis. All of these things may increase patient survival. Sensitization, pair kidney exchange, which we're going to focus on here in a minute, is a big way of dealing with this sensitization issue. And like I said, the longer you're on dialysis, the more likely that you could be sensitized, the more likely you would benefit from something like paired kidney exchanger. I already talked about um, graft survival and, and finding donors. This is what a paired kidney exchange looks like. Let's just uh, simply say you uh, are married and your wife wants to donate to you um, because you have kidney disease and you're different blood types. In the, in the most simple way of doing a paired exchange, your, blood, your wife, who is a blood group A, you're a blood group B, could donate her kidney to someone else that's her, her blood type, and then um, the, that other person's donor that's your blood type can donate to you. That's a simple two-way paired exchange. You could increase that to three-way if there are two different um, um, groups or three different groups that didn't did not match their donors, or you could turn these into the large chains that we've done over time where numerous people don't match their donors and their donors that they don't match donate to someone else and someone else's donor matches to them. That's basically what a paired exchange is. Desensitization, this is an old lithograph um, showing a bloodletting, but that's a, an illustration of what we try to do in desensitization. We take your blood out of your body, kind of like um, dialysis, cleanse it from these antibodies, these proteins that build up, and then put new blood back into your body uh, or put you know, your blood plus plasma back into your body um, that's been cleansed of the antibodies that would have reacted against um, the kidney that you're about to receive. That's pretty much what desensitization is. So how do we increase organ availability? I told you we don't have enough. Well, what we do is we are, in transplant, we're constantly expanding the donor pool. We're allowing more and more people at the more extremes of age, younger and older, to be kidney donors. Um, we're, we're allowing people beyond just the classic brain death. You know, the classic donor was someone that just had a brain injury like um, a high-speed auto accident or motorcycle accident, and the rest of their body is intact. That's the classic old um, kidney donor or, or organ donor. But now, even people that are dying for other reasons um, can be brought to the operating room after the family consents to be um, donors. This addresses the crisis that we have right now. We need more live donations. We need to do things like ABO incompatible transplant, where um, through desensitization, you can allow people of different blood types to donate to one another. And then we've already talked about pair kidney exchanges. For ABO incompatible transplant, basically we have to do a test to, real, to recognize how much antibody you have to a person of a different blood type. Just because you're blood type A and a person is blood type B, does not mean you're going to have the same level of anti-B as everyone that's, that's blood group A. People can have very low anti-B antibody. If that is the case, then they could easily undergo uh, an ABO incompatible transplant. Oftentimes, this is easier and safer than undergoing other types of desensitization, and we can do this type of transplant much quicker than putting someone in a paired exchange. 
and remember, timing is of the essence because the quicker and sooner you get transplanted, the more likely that transplant is to last a long time. Um, for our desensitization protocols, there are special medicines we use and uh, plasma exchange. These things allow us to decrease that protein in the blood, and that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to decrease that protein for a snapshot in time. If we can do that for a snapshot in time and then get that transplant done, it doesn't matter what happens in the years to come um, that those antibodies build up again um, because it's, if the body does not have a rejection episode within the first couple of weeks of transplant, then usually it will not have an episode uh, later on. Pair kidney exchanges are a novel way to um, find donors when your donor doesn't match. There are all sorts of great computerized matching algorithms. We work with um, various groups around the country, and now this has really become a more popular way for people that don't match to um, be transplanted. We, we um, do a lot of what's called domino paired exchanges. And what happens in domino paired exchanges is someone um, just comes forward and wants to donate a kidney, although they don't have anyone in mind or anyone specific that they want to donate, and we allow that person to donate to someone um, on our list that already has a donor that they don't match to. And this um, starts a chain reaction, and that's why it's called a domino. One domino falls, and then numerous dominoes fall thereafter. Um, that's our preferred way of doing transplant now with um, these non-directed donors. And to my surprise, and um, happily so, we have a lot more um, altruistic, we call them altruistic or non-directed donors. We have a lot more of these non-directed donors than we've ever had. I um, have a couple of papers here that I wrote um, just to show what education can do. This paper here was about mostly about pancreas transplantation, but in this study what I found was that um, people, primarily African Americans, were not being educated about um, receiving pancreas transplants. Once we educated them about pancreas transplants, we increased their access by making the patients much more proactive. And this is sort of like the slides I showed you earlier. Um, increasing the knowledge base of the community can change their behavior. This is another um, slide. And again, what I'm showing in this group is that um, although nationally African American patients receive about 11 to 12 percent of the live kidney donors, when we combine ABO incompatible transplant and paired kidney exchange, and education, we were able to vastly increase the live donor rate at our program. In this particular paper, 50% of the patients that received live kidney transplants at our center were African American because we brought this technology and education to bear. The results, because people always ask, okay, you increase access to this higher risk cohort because African Americans, because they sit on hemodialysis longer, because it's harder to get them transplanted, because they tend to come from lower socioeconomic groups, they are a more challenging group to transplant. What we found, even in the sensitized patients, even in patients that got ABO incompatible transplants, the outcomes were as good as our um, Caucasian patients um, that got um, just normal live kidney transplants. So the outcomes were very good. And this is um, the slide that shows the African-American patients received over 55% of these transplants in our program compared to 13% in the United States. Um, again, this is just a, um, another illustration of paired kidney exchange um, comparing a two-way to a three-way. And again, what you see there is all you need to participate in a paired kidney exchange is a donor pretty much anywhere in the United States. If you have a donor, even if your donor does not match, you will be transplanted either um, directly or through an exchange or a desensitization. Um, this is just an illustration of a very large um, paired kidney exchange that we did. At the time, it was um, um, a world's record. We did 13 patients at the same time. 
And then this is an illustration of the fact that again and again we did these large paired exchanges and the way we did them was first of all we wanted to address the problem in this area which were was uh, minority patients not getting great access we utilized non-directed donors to cause these large domino paired exchanges to be done anyone that didn't match in one exchange was carried over to another and um, and we were able to set the world's record on four different occasions by doing it this way. This was the, um, uh, what, which remains the largest paired kidney exchange um, done at, um, uh, in a short period of time. These were 16 patients. They were all transplanted um, at one time. And the way we were able to do that was, um, this was a domino paired exchange. The gentleman in the upper left was a non-directed donor, and he set off this whole cascade of events that ended when 16 different patients were transplanted. This gentleman was a um, um, Iraqi and Afghan, Afghanistan war veteran who was a medic and was tired of seeing people die and decided to give life, and 16 different people were transplanted as a result of his gift. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Melanson. That's been a really interesting and wonderful webinar so far. And now we'd like to ask you some questions um, that we've gotten from our attendees during the course of the webinar. So uh, let's just start with um, how can I get included in a paired kidney exchange? How, do, how would I sign up for something like that? So the first thing, um, anyone that would um, want to be included in a pair of kidney exchange, first they, had, they need to get on the transplant list. Because just like anyone that needs a transplant, they have to come into a transplant center and be evaluated. I'm at George Washington University, so for us, you would simply come in, you'd call our um, transplant center, you'd get an appointment, and then we would evaluate you to be a uh, kidney transplant recipient. Once you're on the list, then you could either get a live donor or a uh, deceased donor. If you have a donor, that's the quickest way to get transplanted. So it can either be done directly or if the person needs to be a part of a paired exchange, their donor would need to donate to someone else. Rarely people can still be a part of a paired exchange if they don't have a donor, uh, but it is, it's, it's much more difficult because we choose people to be on these paired exchanges, usually based on the fact that they have a, a donor. Every now and again, because of a, a live donor may come forward that um, does not match to anyone, but they match very well with one of our patients that otherwise would not be transplanted um, with a live donor because they didn't have a live donor and they're just sitting awaiting a deceased donor. In that situation, we'll just pick them off our list and allow this live donor to donate to them. Okay. Are, do all transplant centers offer paired kidney exchange transplants? Um, a lot more than used to. Um, uh, when I first started doing these, when I was at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, about eight years ago, uh, only about 5% of programs in the country did this. Now, I would say um, in the order of um, half of the programs in the country, about 50% regularly uh, participate in some sort of paired exchange uh, program. Um, even more will do it on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, the majority of transplant programs in the country, even very small um, transplant programs, will offer some sort of paired kidney exchange. And if the program where um, you um, are listed or you've gone to does not participate, one in the area most assuredly does because it has um, really um, um, spread throughout all of the regions of the country. Thank you. Um, does insurance coverage differ at all for a paired exchange compared to a deceased donor transplant or a standard living donor transplant? Um, no, no. The insurance coverage is pretty much the same. Um, whatever um, insurance you have will typically cover um, a live donor versus deceased donor transplant. And for a paired kidney um, transplants and for, for even for normal live donor transplants, the donor, the live donor's 
um, care is always covered under the recipient's insurance. And that's true for a direct donation by live donor or a paired kidney exchange. So the insurance really um, does not change. There are some facets of that that need to be investigated by the financial um, uh, consultants at the transplant centers, and we always have our consultants look at this before transplant. But for the most part, the insurance is exactly the same, deceased donor versus live donor uh, transplant. Great, great. I will tell you that um, insurance companies tend to rather live donor transplants because the outcomes are better, um, the kidneys tend to work quicker, and the patients have shorter hospitalizations. And that all translates to better outcomes and less output by the insurance company. So they actually rather um, live donor transplant, even paired kidney exchange live donor transplant. Okay. Um, is there, do you, does a patient have to be at any particular stage of kidney disease in order to have it, the evaluation for a transplant? It's a very good question, and the answer is yes. Usually, you need to be um, stage four or stage five to be evaluated for um, a kidney transplant. The first three stages of kidney disease, um, like I said earlier, um, can be managed, and sometimes it will not even progress. So people in the first three stages, and what, what are the first three stages? Uh, but basically, if you're a GFR, uh, which is calculated in your um, um, blood test, is above 30, uh, then your, your kidney function is still too good to, um, to be on dialysis or to be evaluated for a transplant. Once your GFR um, is 20 or less, that's typically the time where you're going to be on a, a transplant list. It can be a little higher. It can be between 20 and 30, so 25 or so, depending on what your symptoms, and, and you could be evaluated, particularly for a live donor transplant. Um, I always encourage people at that stage, which is still stage four, to be evaluated because, like I said earlier, the best time to be transplanted is before you're, you're on dialysis, before you require dialysis. That's called a preemptive transplant. Preemptive transplants last longer, the patients are in their best health, and they do better, they live longer. So I think people should be referred early, but an early referral is still stage four, um, not really stage three kidney disease. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, the incompat incompatible transplants are actually safer. Why is that true? Well. Um, live donor transplant is, uh, is the best type of transplant um, because the kidneys are basically removed and, and placed almost immediately. So the fact that they're out of a human body a very short period of time means that the, the function is better. Also, because we can do all of these special tests on live donors, we can really find out um, the, in very much detail how good the kidney function is in the donor. You're, you're not a, that's not available in a deceased donor transplant in the same detail. Um, that's one reason. The second reason is, AB, I was talking about ABO incompatible transplant. ABO incompatible transplant is, um, we have found through data um, in an analyzing outcomes that these, these transplants have functioned exceedingly well, better than we would have even thought from a a medical point of view, and that's just from going back and looking at, looking at outcomes. So when you, when you go back and look at the outcomes of these patients that we've done, and, you know, we've been doing ABO incompatible transplant in this country for, you know, a, a little over a decade now. Um, we have found that the outcomes are, are better than we would have imagined. Now, why is that? Well, we do special things to, prevent, to, pre, um, to prepare people to receive an ABO incompatible transplant, like plasma exchange and these these certain medications that we give to people, but what we have found is that it's very durable. Once they get treated, once their titer goes down, uh, it does not go back up, and the, um, the outcomes of the kidneys tend to be even better. And I think that the reason that is is because the desensitization, which decreases the chance that you're going to have a problem with the person's kidney that's a different blood type, also decreases the chance that you're going to have a rejection. So. Um, by combining those things, the long-term outcomes have actually been better than even regular transplants. 
Um, how long does it? How long does the um, desensitization process take? Very good question. It depends um, because your level of sensitization is going to matter. The more sensitized you are, the more treatments you will require. Typically, it's no more than um, a few treatments, which means that if you have a live donor transplant, um, it's you're going to start the treatment about a week before the scheduled transplant. Everything can be done every other day over a week's time uh, and then allow you to have the transplant the next, the following week. That's very quick. Oh, it is, it is, it is very quick. Like I said, it's only a few treatments. Uh, people that are very highly sensitized that would require more, currently what we're doing is we're putting them in a pair exchange and finding them a donor that they have much less sensitization to. Okay. So uh, that's how we, we work it out. Um, so what about, our, uh, would the doses or uh, types of immunosuppressant medications be different for somebody who has been desensitized prior to transplant, after, once they're taking immunosuppressants after transplant? Yes, that's another uh, excellent question. These are great questions. And the, um, the answer is yes. People that, um, at least at my center, and, and this is pretty much true across the board, if you are not sensitized and you get a transplant, particularly a live donor transplant, we can start to minimize the amount of medicines that you need to take. Um, what has happened in transplant over the decades is that the medicines have become so much better that we can give less of it, which is good because, you know, in so many ways it can be you can poison the system with too much of this immunosuppression. So if you got a garden variety transplant, let's say you needed a transplant from your sister, um, you're genetically very similar, um, you've never been sensitized, then you get your sister's transplant, you take very little medicine. The, the big thing that we're able to do in people that are not sensitized is stop the steroids. Um, patients tend not to be, like to be on steroids and all of the horror stories of, of of, of being a transplant patient, you know, like back when I was a student in the 1990s, was the acne that people can get, the um, the um, the um, the fact that their skin darkens and, and starts to break out um, because of the steroids. We can give people a lot less steroids and totally take them off if they're not sensitized. People that are sensitized, however, we usually leave on a small dose of steroids. That's one of the big differences. The other difference is. Up front, up front, they get a lot more medicine. They get the plasma exchange and they get uh, other stronger medicines, almost like chemotherapy at the time of transplant. After the time of transplant, the medicines are very similar other than that small dose of steroids. So uh, would, would someone have to go to a special hospital to do this kind of transplant with the desensitization and having an incompatible donor? Yes, another great question. Yes, for garden variety pair kidney exchange, where the you could be at a very small transplant center and if they're participating in paired exchanges, uh, they can participate with any other center in the country. So that you don't have to go to a specialized center to be in a paired kidney exchange. However, if you're going to be desensitized or if you're going to get an EBO incompatible transplant, then you have to go to a specialized center. These there are more centers that are doing these types of transplants around the country. Um, they tend to be concentrated to the Northeast, uh, you know, where we are, uh, but they, they, they have them throughout the, the country. But that is definitely much less common to have desensitization and ABO incompatibility offered. But, you know, the big transplant centers, and they have large centers in all regions of the country now, they tend to be on the coast in the, the Northeast and the um, and West Coast, but you can find them anywhere throughout the United States. Of course, um, we offer this at my <laughs> So people can come from anywhere in the world to us. Um, is this considered an experimental procedure such that the insurance company might have an issue approving it? Another great question. You know, about eight years ago when we were doing these at, at Hopkins, it was. And we used to have to fight with insurance companies uh, quite often. But because the outcomes have been so good, um, no, we no longer have those problems with insurance companies. Now, of course, there can always be a caveat to that. But for the most part, um, 
If it is pretty straightforward and it's no more than a week of treatment before transplant, um, even though it does add about $30,000 to the bill, um, that is really, I know it's a lot of money, but that's a drop in the bucket for what the insurance companies are going to be paying um, in the life of that transplant. And given the great outcomes that we've had in doing these across the country, uh, insurance companies now um, regularly pay for this uh, because of the outcomes have been so good. Um, are there any specific risks of getting um, a desensitized or an incompatible kidney transplant? Yes, yeah, again, another great question. And the risks are, they really have to do with the amount of medicines that you have to get. The more immunosuppression you get, then the more that the problems of immunosuppression can occur. And what are the problems with immunosuppression? Well, number one, infection. So people that are desensitized, that, that, are, that go through plasmapheresis, that uh, get these stronger medicines, they have an increased risk of infection. They have a slight increased risk of malignancy as well. However, um, the way it's done now, and there was a learning curve over the last 10 years, but I do believe that what we are doing now at most of the large centers that are doing this, um, we really will use an algorithm to try to determine, well, how much immunosuppression should we be giving this patient, and when is it too much so that we start looking for a different type of donor. So let's go back to the scenario I gave you earlier. I said that you and your sister were a great match, right? So that's a no-brainer. We just give you your sister's kidney. All right, let's say now that um, your sister still wants to be your donor, but instead of you um, being a person that's never had a transplant before not having problems, you've had three children by your husband, and you um, had a prior transplant, and you had a blood transfusion. All these things cause you to build up antibodies. When we build up antibodies, sometimes we build them up against the people that we're most genetically similar to. So now you've built up antibodies against your sister. Your sister still wants to donate to you, and it is going to be actually a benefit for us to say, although your sister wants to donate to you, you have all these antibodies to her. Your risk in getting her, her kidney is actually higher. Your risk of, of rejection goes way up because of these antibodies that you built up. And if we give you all the medicines we'd have to do to try to get your antibody level down, now your risk because of um, all of the medicines goes up for infection and malignancy. So what we then do is we start looking for another donor for you. That's when paired exchange really, I believe, is at its best. So now we find someone in uh, another city who actually matches a lot closer to you. You don't have antibodies to that person. So even though you have a lot of antibodies to your sister, this new person that wants to donate to you, you have no antibodies to them. So you are able to then get that kidney without all this extra medicine, without being desensitized, and your sister can now donate to that woman's husband who needed a transplant. She was not a good match for him because he had built up antibodies to her. So that's when paired exchange is really at its best. And what we do, and we have these conversations with the patients. I'm going through this right now with the group that I'm about to um, um, transplant via a paired exchange. Um, we have these very frank discussions with the patients. We let them know, well, this is the situation with the donor that you basically brought to the party, and this is the situation with the donor that we think would work better for you. But you want the patients to know, to go in eyes open, so that they realize why you're trying to give them a different donor. Because, you know, these things can be very emotional for the patient. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and life-changing. It's just wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's like the slide I showed earlier. A lot of times, you know, people think about it with heart transplant or liver transplant more so. They realize how life-saving it is. But kidney transplant is life-saving. You go from um, being on dialysis, having an average lifespan of four to five years, um, all comers, versus an average lifespan of greater than 20 years. That's a huge difference in, in life, and that's what happens when you get a transplant. Yeah. So great. Um, speaking of the, the exchange you're, you're about to do, um, we had a question from someone wondering if you would be doing another very large paired exchange, and if so, how would a transplant center get involved? It's a very good question. So um, it's ironic um, 
we are now doing less of these very large exchanges. And the reason is, I think it's a good reason, we have changed how deceased donor transplants are done in this country. In other words, because this sensitized group of patients, which used to be 5 to 10% of the list, has now grown to 35% of the list. People um, are more sensitized than they used to be. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is now we have better ways of testing for it. So people will probably always sensitize, but now um, transplant centers have become more savvy in figuring out that people were trans were, are sensitized. You know, in the old days, in the 1980s, sometimes people would get transplanted and would just reject and no one knew why. Well, now we're figuring out they had these antibodies that no one even could test for. So now we can test for them. But anyway, as a result of sensitization becoming such a problem in the transplant community, what we as a community decided to do was change the algorithm as to how deceased donors are, um, are allocated. So now the deceased donor kidneys will go to the sensitized patients quicker and in, a, in, and in a more free fashion. So let's say in your scenario where you are very highly sensitized. Now when I put you on my list, as I'm working you up with your husband and, and with a paired exchange, on the deceased donor list, you get all these extra points. So let's say while we're working you up, a deceased donor in California matches you, and you have no antibodies to them. With the way that the new algorithm is worked for deceased donor transplant, that kidney comes immediately to you. So we now have less of these patients that we couldn't find of transplants for other than putting them in paired kidney exchanges. Given the fact that we are doing such a good job with the deceased donor allocation, even though we still don't have enough deceased donors to go around, um, remember we're only um, doing about 10,000 deceased donor transplants per year. We are allocating them in a, um, I think, a better fashion to these patients that were almost impossible to match. Given that these people are now being more readily transplanted, we now have less of an impetus to do the very, very large parent exchanges. We, we still have a, a, an impetus to do the smaller ones, and that's what I'm finding. I'm doing a lot more of the two and three-way parent exchanges, which what I, I like to do those, um, honestly, because I think that uh, what you want is to get people transplanted as quick as possible, rather than put them off and do a, you know, so if I have to wait four months to do a large exchange or two weeks, or a month and do start doing smaller ones, I'm going to do the small ones because your, your life expectancy shoots up right up um, after transplant. So I want to get people transplanted as quickly as possible. Um, as far as who participates, the patient should always ask the center when they're being evaluated if they participate in parent exchanges. Like I said, it is, I would say, 80% of programs in the country right now will participate in some way, even very small centers. Great. Um, with respect, you know, we talked about um, African Americans having um, now donating more. Um, is that also now translating to them receiving more transplants? Yes. So um, the issue with African Americans is um, African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population. However, African Americans have about 35% of in state of the people with in stage renal disease in this country. All right, so even at um, outpacing their um, population, so if you say well, African Americans are actually um, donating uh, almost 20% of the organs that's available, that's still not enough for their increase in need. So it's great because we went from uh, around 2% of donors now up to you know over 15% of donors, but there still needs to be a further, further increase. I think the great part, of, particularly of this sort of a conversation, is showing how education, how knowledge empowers people. Um, the grassroots organizations that went into the community, into the churches, it, um, health fairs, et cetera, et cetera, educated people change their behavior. So um, again, I lived through this as a medical student and a resident. It was exceedingly rare 
for um, our African American patients to be uh, deceased donors. And now, um, in, um, in in these urban centers, what we're finding is that's your most altruistic group of, of patients. I think we need more education of everyone, but it just shows how powerful knowledge can be. Knowledge is power. So what kind of impact do you think um, these new techniques that you're using, uh, desensitization and, and incompatible uh, donor transplants, what effect do you think that will have on the prevalence of transplant in the African American community? Oh, well, I can tell you it already has um, changed things because we definitely have increased the rate of transplant in the African American community. And, and again, what we have found traditionally in um, these urban centers is that African Americans, um, Hispanic Americans, um, ethnic minorities in this country tend to be on dialysis longer. The longer you're on dialysis, just your blood going through that cycler for hemodialysis, and even some of what goes on in peritoneal dialysis, it increases the chance that these antibodies are going to build up in your system. So a big reason why African Americans were sitting on, even when they got on the transplant list, the reason why they were sitting waiting had to do with the matches. Remember, the computers is always matching people um, as you sit on the list. Every day people die in this country and, and their organs are matched to people that are on the list. Well, the more antibodies you have, the less likely you're going to get um, chosen for transplant. So by, um, by actually desensitizing people, what you un uh, enable them to do is to receive more of their live donor transplants from their friends or family, number one. And then number two, you're going to decrease their antibodies while they sit and wait. I have seen this. So we have these desensitization protocols don't only start at the time of transplant. They can start months, even a year before transplant. So people that we measure them, um, their uh, antibody levels in their blood, and we find that they're sensitized, we start them on medicines right away. We lower the antibody level, and that increases their chance of being transplanted. Um, the, we have percentages. Uh, don't need to get into the weeds, but the percentage can be all the way from 0 to 100. Uh, zero being no sensitization, 100 being your chance of having antibodies to a typical American is 100%, at least theoretically. We have um, recently transplanted um, um, at least six or seven of these patients in the last few months, strictly because we started them on medicine to lower their antibody levels. So when the computer looked at their blood, because remember, people on the transplant list, their blood's being analyzed every month. So as we were analyzing their blood, the antibody levels went down, increased, the, increased their likelihood of being transplanted, and we were able to transplant them, particularly because people with those high levels of sensitization now get extra points in the uh, algorithm. So desensitization has been huge for sensitized patients, but particularly minority patients and particularly African Americans. That's really great. It's, you know, opening up so many doors for people just we're, we're, what a great new thing you're doing. <laughs> yes, yes, we, we, in, we enjoy increasing access. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering um, if a patient, you mentioned that patients should ask at their transplant center if this type of thing is available. If the transplant center says no, how do they find one that does it? Great. So, um, f well, first of all, anyone that gets to a point of requiring a, a transplant and um, should be going in for an evaluation. And anyone that's going in for an evaluation should go to more than one center because it increases your chance of getting transplanted. Studies have shown that the optimal number of places you need to be listed um, in order to get transplanted is three. So people should be multi-listing. The government actually encourages patients to be what's called multi-listed. And when you go in for a transplant evaluation, part of the literature that they are required by law to give you states that you need to be going to more than one center. Um, every single one of these um, centers and hospitals that do transplant, because you're only going to, transplant is only done at super duper specialized hospitals. So in the most rural of areas in this country, the place where you're going for your transplant is going to be the very specialized medical center. Um, every one of these centers has a website, and this information is going to be right on their website. So you can go to the website and look up if they are 
uh, participating. Like I said, it is uh, exceedingly rare for a, pay, for a center not to be participating in, in some sort of peer exchange now because the outcomes have been so good and the um, access has, has increased um, so profoundly. So pretty much everywhere is going to participate. But you can go to the website even before your appointment and find out. If for some reason it's not clear on the website, you can call them and ask them. You know, that's the, the, the point of the first slide that I showed. People have to be proactive. You know, um, gone are the days when you should be passive about your health care. You have to be aggressive because this is life and death. If you're passive, sit on dialysis, ask no questions, then your life is going to be much, much shortened. And that is a statistical fact. Now, whenever I give these talks, Someone always raises their hand in the back of the room and tells me they've been on dialysis for 25 years. I get it. There are exceptions to the rule, but what we're talking about is the generalities of statistics. And statistically speaking, it's going to be better to get transplanted and transplanted early. And in order to, um, to avail yourself to the system, you have to be aggressive in seeking the information. Dr. Melissa, this has been a Real pleasure. I have learned so much, and I'm sure everybody in our audience today has as well. Um, I, I want to talk about our next webinar. Our next webinar is going to be on uh, Tuesday, January 17th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Our speaker, Dr. Ken Weiland, is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health and Division of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Weiland is an expert in the field with more than 70 peer-reviewed journal articles. He will talk to us about strategies for improving the effectiveness of exercise training in patients with kidney failure. Registrations open now. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes today, please do not close your browser window you may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up, proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar programs the best they can be. Happy holidays, everybody, and we'll talk to you in January.